Good morning. Welcome to worship this Sunday morning. It's good to see you all here today. We have just a couple of announcements, and I know that I have a few other people who would like to share announcements. Laura, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, believe it or not, next Sunday, the deacons will be starting to sell their Easter flowers because Easter is going to sneak up on us before you know it. We'll be selling tulips and daffodils, <clears throat> excuse me, and they'll be $10 each, and um, we'll be selling them for the next three weeks. So, And if you write a check, please put in the memo uh, Easter flowers so we can help the counters uh, keep track of everything. And also, uh, on March 6th, the worship committee will be sponsoring the next Supper Church. And if you were at the last one, it was a great event. It was really, really nice. And worship will be hosting the dinner, and the deacons will be in charge of the content. And there will be some of the same stations with a few twists on them. Plus, you'll get to learn uh, some more information about what it means to be a deacon, and also that you don't officially have to be on the deacon's board, board to help us. So uh, please come. It was really nice, delicious food and um, just wonderful fellowship. Thank you. Thank you. And Tom has an announcement. Good morning. I just wanted to, to thank everyone. Um, this year's pledge drive, I, I, <laughs> I had my doubts uh, at the end of, toward the end of last year, but uh, it, it really, it, it was the, the best drive we've had in, in years. Uh, we actually exceeded the amount of money pledged uh, this year than we did um, last year by, by a few thousand dollars. Um, and I, I just, I really thank um, Rebecca, especially for the focus on, on pledging and getting everyone involved, everyone to commit to, to, to making a pledge. Um, and um, Mary Lee and, and Diane uh, for, for their help in, in the, uh, the pledges and, and the, the little skit that Diane came up with earlier. But I, I just, I was so pleased that uh, uh, it turned out so well. We have, I had a phone call yesterday from someone that uh, doesn't attend church, but pledges and, and wants to give and we have people from Florida that that uh, pledge and, and give it's just it's it's just so rewarding uh, the number of folks that care uh, and continue to pledge and and, and I've, I've always said that um, you know it's, it's not the amount of money we're not here to judge it's just simply that commitment that Rebecca had uh, brought up time and time again about making a pledge and, um, and then fulfilling that, that commitment. But I was just so very happy <laughs> about the, the pledge that, uh, the pledges that came in and uh, just, just wanted to, uh, to share that with you folks and to thank you, to thank you all, both here and those maybe watching at home for your efforts in contributing to this church uh, to, to make this church go forward. So thank you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you. I think this deserves a round of applause for all of you. Well done. Well done. I'd like to uh, let you know, when you see 30 or 40 people in the congregation here, be assured that the congregation is larger than just who you see around you. We have a number of people who regularly watch our live stream. Uh, at the same time, some of you uh, at home now, some of our homebound are watching right now. And so we thank you for your support, for your commitment. I want to let you know, too, that when the offering time comes, uh, Betsy has now managed to create a QR code. That's one of those funny little square um, codes that you can use your phone with. And if you use your camera and uh, put your camera over that code, it takes you right to the link for um, making online donations through Tithely. That's the, uh, the app that we use. So if you're at home and you'd like to contribute uh, towards the ministry of this church, towards the ministry of God in this city of Tonawanda, um, I encourage you to go ahead and use the QR code and click right on the screen so that you can add your donations uh, to all of our pledges. If you'd like to pledge, uh, certainly send me a message um, or uh, call the office.
put something on Facebook and I'll get back to you and uh, return your inquiry. Are there other announcements to share? Let us gather our hearts in worship this morning. Let's open worship by responsively reading the call to worship. Lent calls us to journey this and every day, following Jesus wherever he leads us. Lent calls us to journey to the place where God covenants with us to receive the new names we are given. Lent calls us to worship together to tell future generations the good news. Lent calls us to faithful living, to trust the one who gives us life. Lent calls us to journey with God. God, your son Jesus Christ bore the cross for our salvation and was raised from the dead for the redemption of the world. Give us the courage to take up our cross and follow him, that through his grace we may accept the cost of faithful discipleship and receive the joy of everlasting life with Christ, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our opening hymn today is number 157, I Danced in the Morning. Please stand if you are able.
Given a test on our faith, would we have a passing grade? Looking at our lives of discipleship, would we be considered good models for others? When we fail to trust God, we discover that we do indeed lead barren lives. Let us be honest as we stand before our God and bring our confessions for forgiveness and hope. God of Sarah and Abraham, in this holy place, we know how weak is our discipleship. We can spend hours at the computer, but only give you fleeting moments of our time. We can talk endlessly on our cell phones, but fall silent when it comes to sharing our fears, our worries, our hopes with you. We seek quick fixes for our problems rather than seeking your vision and future for our lives. God of Peter, Paul, and the psalmist, forgive us for our lack of trust, for our faithless living, for our closing our ears to the call of Jesus. Forgive us so we may lay aside all that keeps us from you, so we may take up the life you offer to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And now use a few moments of silence to share your own thoughts with God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is the good news. God does not go back on the promises made so long ago. God does not reject us. God redeems us. God does not withhold love. God pours it into our barren lives. Forgiven Forgiven of our our sins, filled filled with with hope, living living in relationship with God and one another, another. we We are a new people. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's take a moment and share the peace of Christ with one another. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive your word, reveal to us the good news, and enable us to trust in the promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is selections from the 17th chapter of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. 
God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. I'm Rebecca, and I'm a child of God. We're all gathered here together, all children of God. One of the special children of God that I'd like to have join me today is Jess. <coughs> Jess, thank you so much. Now, a lot of you have been praying for me and watching me as I've been getting better and stronger. You can tell that I can walk around more. I'm so grateful for all of your prayers, and, and God is so good. However, I do um, still have the discretion not to stand up here and wave my arms around and show you body prayers uh, without a bodyguard. So Jess has uh, agreed to be the example for you. We are doing a prayerful Lent this season. If you haven't picked one up, I hope you will pick up one of our prayerful Lent devotionals. It's the curric curriculum we're using for Sunday school each week. And you probably noticed that we also include it in the sermon and in various other activities. We've got prayer stations and hope that you'll try them out. But this week is all about prayer in motion, body prayers. And we did a few body prayers during Sunday school. Um, we did a quiet one. Uh, we did a little bit more rowdy one. Um, and then we did a yoga one. If you have the, um, the devotional, you'll find that there's a link to praying with the body. There's a YouTube that you can use to, to pray Psalm 32 uh, using yoga poses. So we'll have some of that available. Walking the labyrinth, taking a walk in nature. If you have any questions about this, um, talk to any of our Sunday school teachers or CE people like Jess. Are you ready, Jess? Okay, she's gonna do this prayer one time through with you watching, and then I'm gonna invite you to stand up, move around, and. Uh, and copy these motions. This is a way you can pray without words. Last week we were doing a listening prayer, praying with our breath and silence. And this time we're still not using words so much as we are using our whole body. So you can repeat this prayer several times in a row. You might experiment with using this maybe to open up your prayer time um, or um, moving on to another one of the prayer practices. Maybe this would be your warm up to walking a labyrinth. So stand up, comfortably, comfortably balanced, feet firmly planted, hands by your side, and slowly bring your hands together in prayer. Bow or empty yourself before God and reach towards the earth. Now reach both hands high over your head towards God. Receive God's peace in your heart as your hands come down and cross each other over your heart. Share God's peace with your community by reaching your hands out straight to your left and right sides. And then slowly return and center yourself, bringing your hands down along the outside of your legs. I saw a lot of you copying me in the seated version of this. If, like me, you have any balance issues, please remain seated. The rest of you, come on, stand up. Move into the aisle if you need a little bit more space. Let's all pray this together. Standing up comfortably balanced, feet firmly planted. Slowly bring your hands together in prayer. Bow or empty yourself before God. Reach towards the earth. And now reach both hands high over your head towards God. Receive God's peace in your heart as your hands come down and cross each other over your heart. Share God's peace with your community by reaching your hands out left and right. And now return to center, bringing your hands down to the sides. Let's do that one more time. Stand comfortably balanced, feet firmly planted. Bring your hands together in prayer. Bow or empty yourself before God. 
reach towards the earth. And now reach both hands high over your head towards God. Receive God's peace in your heart as your hands come down and cross each other over your heart. Now share God's peace with your community by reaching left and right as far as you can. Take a deep breath and then return and center yourself, bringing your hands back down along your legs. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you all. I hope you'll explore more different ways to pray, uh, like this body prayer. Let's read responsively from the 22nd uh, chapter of Psalms, verses 23 through 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. For dominion belongs to the Lord. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Posterity will serve him. And proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Our gospel lesson this morning is taken from the gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So when you think about your faith, I wonder, do you see faith as a noun or as a verb? Is faith a thing or is it an action? Is faith a destination, or is it a journey? Our scripture readings today speak to us of some key moments in our faith, from that foundational covenant with Abraham to the bigger picture of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, and that is that Jesus must suffer and die. Several times in our lectionary cycle, and then again in some of our seasonal holidays, 
Our Old Testament lesson reminds us of this very story of Abram and Sarai and the covenant that God makes with them. That covenant, that, that profound promise that God makes to Abraham that this one pretty elderly couple with no children will one day be the parents of an entirely new nation and that this nation will grow in number to be greater than the number of stars in the sky. Furthermore, this great nation will act as a way for God to bless all nations, all peoples of the world. The whole world will find blessings because of this one great promised nation. The psalm we just read proclaims the greatness of God, and it describes the many actions that God's people will take in response to God's greatness. The people will bow down to the Lord. They will worship him. They will remember God's mighty acts of protection and nurture. The poor will eat and be satisfied. And remember that part of the covenant about all nations finding blessing through the work of this one promised nation of Israel? Verse 27 of our psalm reads, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. And this isn't a sort of a one-and-done worship. It's not one special event. It's an ongoing event, signified by the in inclusion not only of those who have gone before, in verse 29, to him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. And then verses 30 and 31 speak about the future. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. And there we have it, past, present, and future. The promise and the blessing the worship and, and the continuity of the story with each generation declaring God's good news to the next generation. What a covenant. What a promise for everyone, the whole world. In our gospel reading from the Gospel of Mark, we find Jesus once again teaching his disciples important lessons of faith. This time, however, the message is sobering, that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days again, rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And what response did he receive? Well, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. <coughs> Jesus is preparing his followers for the future. He's painting this bigger picture for them of his role in God's plan. It's not simply a matter of good news for these people, here and now, in the life of Jesus. People who are currently suffering and whose pain, hunger, illness, and sin, Jesus is able to, to reconcile and re reverse. Peter isn't seeing that bigger picture. He's focused on his own here and now, and he's looking for a more positive, more comforting message from Jesus. We all know how the story ends. As we walk through this season of Lent, we know that we are walking towards a very dark time with Jesus in Jerusalem. And even the 12 disciples, those closest to him, those privy to the most regular and sometimes private, deep teachings, and people who had already given up a great deal in order to follow Jesus over the course of this three-year ministry, even these 12 are wholly unprepared for the darker days that will be coming. Peter's rebuke allows Jesus the opportunity to put everyone on notice, the disciples as well as the crowd. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Iconic words, and Jesus spoke them before his own crucifixion. Take up your cross and follow me. Crucifixion was a, was a horrific death, and it was reserved for those who most particularly defied authority. The condemned was sentenced and then made to carry his own cross through the streets to the place of execution. What a way to put the condemned to the ultimate humility. The pride that led the criminal to rebel, to defy authority, replaced by this humiliating act of carrying one's own execution device through the streets for all to see, and ultimately the final act the condemned person would make. Take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean for you today? I wonder what burden are you asked to take up? What prideful traits might you be asked to set down? And what sort of promises are we holding on to? Promises of blessing, perhaps, and of God's constant and faithful love for us? Promises of growth. So let's look at how we understand our faith and whether faith is best understood, as I opened with, as a noun or as a verb. Of course, we can check the dictionary and there we find that the word faith is categorized as a noun. The Oxford Dictionary offers two definitions. First, complete trust or confidence in something or someone. Faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And the second definition is a strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. A strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. Well, I read that and wondered, spiritual apprehension? That required another dictionary de definition and uh, uh, Oxford offers us another two. Apprehension can be an anxiety or a fear that something bad will happen. But apprehension can also be understanding something deeply, grasping it. So it would seem that this second definition is the best match. That spiritual apprehension then would mean a spiritual understanding. Faith is a belief in God based on spiritual understanding or perhaps spiritual experience instead of proof. How does that strike you? If we take the first definition, faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. I wonder how do we develop the faith, that complete trust in someone or something? And if we prefer to look at the second definition, a strong belief in God based on our spiritual understanding, how do we develop that? It's not based on factual proof or evidence. How do we develop the spiritual intuition, the spiritual apprehension or confidence that what we are told about God is true. On the other hand, if we begin to see faith as a verb, it reminds us that faith must be active if it's worth anything at all. We arrive at faith by actively testing the truth of the things we learn about God. And we express our faith by actively following Jesus by putting our intellectual concepts about God into concrete action, like walking with God, like feeding the hungry, like taking up our cross to follow Jesus. So I return again to my second question. Is faith a thing or an action? Do you see it more as something tangible or something to do? Remember the parable about the mustard seed? In it, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. A mustard seed that starts infinitesimally small and grows large enough to serve as a home, a shelter, and much more. A mustard seed is certainly a thing, but the parable is about more than just the one tiny seed. It's about the process. It's about growth. It's about possibilities. And that's why faith feels more like an action to me. Finally, when you think about faith, do you see it more as a destination or is it the journey? When we talk about faith formation, is it something we can teach to children and teach to newcomers? And once that process is done, whether it takes weeks or months or years, are we then fully formed in faith? Some of our Christian brothers and sisters see the act of coming to faith as a one-time decision, a choice, a conversion, a moment in time when we are confronted with the facts of faith and we take a leap of faith, perhaps, and commit our lives to Christ. Some call it being saved or being converted. The people I was raised around talked that way a lot, and sermons in church were all about being saved, making that commitment, deciding. For many of us who made the decision at an early age, it sometimes felt as if that was the end of the process. We were saved, we were in, that was it. But churches that focus on faith in this one-time event often do a pretty poor job of growing disciples. Too much focus on that one moment in time, that one decision to follow Christ, creates less energy for faith formation, for growing in faith for living a life of faith, for walking with God, serving God, and growing more and more faithful with each passing year. That's why I understand faith as my lifelong journey and not some one-time accomplishment. It's a little bit like education and learning. I wonder how you see those education and learning. Is it something you did once and now you don't have to ever do it again? Once you finished a course, once you graduated from school, are you done with learning? And then in the church, do you see Christian education as one of those things kids do? Maybe the youth, but once kids get confirmed, they're done, they graduated. I wonder how many of the ones that have treated confirmation as a sort of a graduation from faith formation are still actively living their faith today. I want all of us to be lifelong learners, to learn something new every day, to keep on learning, to keep on growing. I hope you're all following the prayerful Lent practices that we're offering you this season. And again, if you haven't picked up one of the devotionals, please do. I challenge you to take, take on some new prayer practice Maybe pray more frequently than you normally do. Try a new form of prayer. Join us before worship for Sundays, on Sundays for all age faith formation and learn together. Share your prayer and faith life together. We all gather in the parlor, all the way from Adam up to Alvin and anybody beyond. Today we prayed in various ways and then we split up to do various response activities. We have prayer stations of many different kinds for adults, teens, kids, and we share our faith together. You can visit a prayer station before worship, after worship, or feel free to come in during the week. Let me know that you're coming and I'll meet with you and show you some new forms of prayer. There are prayer beads, there are ancient prayers, there's praying with scripture, all sorts of prayer. If you'd like to pray with me, I encourage you to give me a call to reach out. Like faith, prayer is more than just a word. It's more than simply a one-time action. It's more even than a specific set of words that we utter. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pray without ceasing. Now, if we see prayer as something that 
we say or even something that we do in one specific way, it's difficult to see how we could do that without ceasing. There certainly are other things that we need to do, like work, go to school, do chores, care for ourselves and others. Now, if we tried to pray the Lord's Prayer without ceasing, we'll end up starved as well as not much use to those around us. But when we see prayer as an attitude, prayer as a relationship that we maintain with our God, then it's easier to see how we can pray without ceasing. This week I encourage you to try prayer in motion. Pray as you walk. Pray as you drive. Pray as you go about your daily business. Pray in ways that you take care of one another. Let faith be your journey, and yet let your life itself be your prayer. Amen. Our next hymn is a prayer. Sing with me hymn 468. <laughs> or pray with me. Pray, sing. Thank you. Please be seated. We come now to our time of prayer, and I encourage you, if you're on the live stream and you have a prayer that you'd like to add to our list of prayer requests today, feel free to uh, post a message on Facebook or send a text <coughs> to me or anyone that you know who might be here today. I'll always be checking to, to see whether there's new prayer requests that have come in uh, that way from all of you who are at home. I come this morning with one text prayer that came to me as I was driving in today from Kelsey. Kelsey asks us specifically to pray for her friend, Maddie. Her friend Maddie, one of her best friends, was in a really bad car accident a month or two ago, and last night they found out she had a brain bleed and is having surgery this morning. So prayers for Maddie, please. Other prayer requests? Raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. Joys or concerns? Linda, can you update us on your son? Yeah, my son Paul. Um, we've been praying for him. Uh, he had surgery again on Friday and he is having a difficult time with it right now. So the more prayers we can give to him the better, because they do work. And I thank everyone for doing it for me. Thank you. Continued prayers for Paul. Other joys or concerns? Prayers for Lisa, who's having um, health issues. Lisa? Lisa? Other joys or concerns to share? I know that uh, we've been praying for Deal Kowski, and she was hospitalized again with pneumonia, uh, but the good news came out, thank you Pat for sharing with us the good news that came out that she is now finally 
off the ventilator again and breathing on her own. So continued prayers for Deal um, that she'll be able to kick this pneumonia uh, once and for all. Let us bring our prayers to the Lord. Choosing an aged, barren couple to parent your holy people. Calling us to set aside ourselves and to shoulder a cross. Showering us with love and mercy when we do nothing to deserve these gifts. You always act in ways that surprise us, God of our parents. In hospital rooms where we wait in anxious expectation in classrooms where we chew on pencils while taking tests, in this unholy mess we call life, you always call us to faithfulness and trust, cross-bearer for us all. In the warmth of spring's approach, we hear your voice. In the moonlight of winter's last night, we see your face. In the silence of a child sleeping, we breathe in your grace. You are always with us in the ordinary moments of life, spirit of holiness. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings to us. We thank you for the blessings of commitment as so many of the members and friends of this church have stepped up to make pledges, to continue the ministry here that you have called us to. We thank you for the growth, for the many more people watching this worship service live at the same time or perhaps later in the week. We thank you for the reach that your word is given through this online source. We pray for each and every person here in this room and watching this broadcast. Lord, bless all who gather. Bless all who are praying to you this day. Lord, we specifically ask your healing, your comfort. We ask prayers for Lisa, for Maddie, for Deal, for Paul, Kathy, Patricia, Mary, Terry's parents, Doug Crossan, Bob, Dana, Ian, Liam. Bob and Derek. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God and community, holy and one, may we see you, hear you, and know you as we move through this Lenten season, even as we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What will it profit us to gain the whole world and forfeit our life. With all humility, let us make our offering to God, trusting not in worldly gain, but in God's sustaining grace. And if you're online, feel free to use the QR code to uh, use the app Tithely to make your donations to ministry. <clears throat>
verse of hymn 612. Please stand. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. May these gifts represent our willingness to deny ourselves so others might be blessed by your grace, your peace, as well as your hope in every moment of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our, I think it's our closing hymn, is number 835, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And now join me in the charge as together we commit to living prayer in motion. Go now with God on your journey through Lent. We will discover the new name given to each one we meet. Go now with Jesus, walking wherever he leads. We will put our fears as well as our longings behind us. Go now with the Spirit who is always full of surprises. And now may the God of covenant faithfulness enfold you, the beloved Son encourage you, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you in blessing this day and forever. And join me in the choral benediction, Go With Us, Lord, 749.
Nope, 749, please. Oops, that's the wrong one. 748. Please do.